Um, hi, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for um, attending my provocation today. Um, so as uh, Rachel's just mentioned that we're talking about this idea of decolonized knowledge in academic practice and the title for my um, provocation is how do we decolonize knowledge reconstructing the meaning of racism for hegemonic whiteness in higher education. So just wanted to say a big thank you to um, Birmingham City University for the invitation and the opportunity to present and also to Marissa and to Rachel and colleagues for um, the great setup and lead into it. Um, just wanted to, um, Rachel, I know you've already done your um, housekeeping. I just wanted to add is just a gentle reminder that um, some of the content that I'm going to be sharing, whilst it's not written, it may be verbalised. Um, I just wanted to make you aware that if it is does trigger um, anything in terms of um, the discussion or it might be emotive, I'm more than happy to um, set up a chat in Teams um, at a later date to talk about this um, further. So the purpose of my provocation is to share my insights into how I set about decolonizing knowledge um, around racism and then how it was implemented into the module that I want to talk to you about in um, at level six. Um, and the module was titled Identity, Equality and Crime. And as part of this, um, right from the very beginning, um, the students and I looked at this idea of what is acceptable knowledge. Um, and as part of um, designing the module, I wanted to um, explore and um, understand students' perspectives on what they understood to be an acceptable knowledge in terms of um, racism and crime. And, um, and I'm hoping that my talk today will offer some um, contribution um, towards the understanding of what's been excluded from official knowledge around um, the learner and the student regarding decolonization uh, within education. So you'll have seen from my abstract that I've been in teaching for um, 25 years. And so how do I summarize um, 25 years um, teaching in HE? So who am I? Um, right, so I originally was training as a solicitor and then I realised that it wasn't um, for me. So I fell out of, uh, came away from um, training as a solicitor and then I went to work as a researcher at New Scotland Yard uh, for up to 45 years. And there I did working to do with equality and diversity and I also worked with um, victims of rape. And then... Um, then I accidentally um, fell into um, higher education because at the time I had a colleague who um, was teaching and they wanted um, some help with um, race and diversity. So I came along and um, delivered a session with students and, um, and then that's where it all started from. So in terms of higher education for me, um, I come from, um, my background is um, Sikh, I'm a Sikh, but I was also brought up in Christianity. So um, very interesting background. Um, I was the first one in my family to go to university. I was the first one in my family to do um, a law degree. And I was the first one in my family to go on and um, teach in higher education as well. So all of this played a part of um, my identity and into um, this idea of um, sharing my experiences with um, students, which has always been my um, passion from the very beginning when I was started teaching. And it's developed more and more as I've gone into teaching. So I wanted to start off with this idea of um, heightened self-awareness. So I've been teaching for 25 years and I've always taught in either law, uh, criminology and a little bit of sociology. So 
I'm always interested to see students' um, responses to me because when you see the name Nikki Woods, um, you'd automatically think I was a white person because um, I've got a white person's name. So as my Asian um, name when I'm writing is Nikki Mathro. So it's interesting how um, students would perceive that. So prior to coming to Winchester, I've taught at Northampton and I've taught at Southampton. And um, it's always been a background of coming from teaching um, at an institution which was um, multi-diverse, multi-ethnic, having um, a wonderful collection, um, a mixture of um, different students, different backgrounds, and um, and how they uh, perceive each other. So when I came to uh, Winchester, I've been at Winchester for two years and I love my job. Um, I became self-aware of who I was. Um, I have in the past, but more now um, in terms of um, because the campus is predominantly white and um, this idea of um, how would I be received? How would I be perceived? Um, you know, this idea of you're not going to get a second chance to make that first impression. And then it's this idea of impression. What sort of impression was I trying to impress on uh, colleagues, on students? Um, what was it that I wanted them to see when I walked into the classroom? Um, what was it that I wanted them to um, um, understand about me as a person? So this idea of um, how I was perceived or interpreted, understood, maybe judged um, because of my name. And then when I walked into the classroom, um, could be that I don't fit my name <laughs> and I was aware of this and um, I'll share some of the feedback from students much later on and one of the feedbacks that did come was they didn't expect me to be brown <laughs> um, because my name was white so that was quite interesting to have received that feedback from the students so this idea of um, does this make a new guise when I enter um, the room did the students see me differently to what they had imagined in their head? So these were some of the things that made me um, look at my self-awareness and question, question myself. Question as a Just to let you know that I'm teaching undergraduate criminology students at level six. So when I come into this idea of um, being in the classroom, um, as for any lecturer, there's this idea of what Bondi calls this. Um, I hold the position of. I wanted to have a look at this idea of um, my position in the classroom, in the lecture theatre uh, of institutional power. How was this power received um, in the classroom? Um, so. How is this power used by a lecturer? How is this power perceived by the student? How do we communicate this power in terms of um, helping the student to reconstruct not only you as a lecturer and who you are and your purpose of being there, but also from the other point of view is how do we um, see the student? So um, this was um, looking at my positionality within the classroom, looking at me as a person, um, who am I, what am I, how am I being um, shared by the students in terms of talking to each other, and what's their first impressions of me. So, um, first two or three times when I went into the classroom, I was very aware of this, of this power, but not just with the power, but also because of uh, being um, a, um, a lecturer of colour and being in a classroom predominantly with uh, white students. So when I've taught before, I've always had a mixture of students and it's not, obviously you get the nerves and you get 
the um the pre-nerves before you start teaching etc um but i think because i was going into a predominantly white classroom um it made me aware of who i was and that i found really fascinating and um this set about this idea of i wanted to share the students understandings and of racism and um, how this could help towards this decolonizing of knowledge and then um, reconstructing the meaning of racism through shared practice designing and running this module which we titled identity quality and crime so um, i set about um, having talks with different students at level six for those who chose my module because I was really interested in what would they like to see in the module or what would they not like to see in the module and this comes back to this idea of um, what is acceptable knowledge and also this idea of um, what are we not covering that we should be covering um, that the students wanted to see so um, it was really fascinating to sit down with students. Ordinarily, when we're writing a module, we design it, we look at the information, what does the student need to know, um, obviously meeting the learning outcomes, et cetera. But um, I was fascinated um, designing, whilst designing this module, in making sure that I was also um, engaging with the students. So it was a two part, um, a two way aspect of, they were engaging with me, I was engaging with them, but also picking topics within this module that they also found important as part of their learning as well. So um, I found that really fascinating. Um, so we had a lot of discussions um, with not only with colleagues, um, but also with um, students either in groups or individually um, some were happy to share their ideas um, in groups um, others wanted to talk independently um, we'd either do it face to face or we would do it in teams and um, and those that did it individually shared their own experiences their own lived experiences of what they had experienced or um, how they had perceived um, racism equality or diversity because of the way that they had socialized um, from a, um, a younger person or the company that they had um, socialized with or even to the point of how they've been brought up um, so i this was all fed back into um the designing of the module and um as part of um the interactive activities um obviously we use blackboards so i wanted to make sure that i delivered a one hour lecture but a two hour seminar and then at the end of this the during this uh, module um it was evaluated at week five week eight and then it was evaluated at the very end um and it was the feedback that I got from the students which was really interesting that um, I wanted to share with you um, so during the setup of designing the module um, there was a lot of debate and arguments over um, what the students did and didn't want to see um, Obviously, at the end of the day, for me as lecturers, it's about managing student expectations, but also safeguarding within the classroom. And with each lesson, I'd always put up a trigger warning and I always always offered at the end the opportunity of discussing um, subjects with myself. Or I always put in the links to um, student support um, within the university and externally if they need to um, discuss it further. And of course, um, I was very conscious that students would email me beforehand or come and see me if they found that um, the topic was too emotive or too triggering and they wouldn't attend. But the lectures are recorded and students could always listen to them afterwards. Um, and then also um, always make sure that they would be able to talk to me about it as well. I was very, very conscious and it was really important to me that the students always 
were aware that they could always email me or we could have a Teams chat or I could phone them up or we could have a face to face in the um, over coffee or in my office. So um, throughout all of this, um, I was looking at my own experiences as being a student, a law student and then a master's student. And now I'm just doing a doctorate. But when we're looking at racism, I think it's really it's for me, it's really important. How do I share this understanding of what it's like to experience racism, what it's like to watch your parents go through racism, what it's like to um, be a witness to a racial incident, um, what it's like to share these experiences, the challenges of it for a person um, who hasn't experienced racism. Um, so they, the empathy can be developed, the, con the compassion, the construction of why it happens, where it happens, why it happened to a particular individual, who was the perpetrator, and how the victimization of it can impact a person beyond the event itself. So Ben Bowling talks about this idea of um, processes, and I find that very fascinating. So he talks about in his book, uh, Violent Racism, this idea of um, the processes. So when you experience a racial incident, the victim, what happens to the victim as they go through the experience of a racial incident? And that could be any um, incident, any hate crime. But it's this idea of I wanted to share that with the students. And that was through lived experiences of not only my own experiences of um, my family's experiences, but also getting um, practitioners and um, other academics to come in and talk on the module as well. So just want to just jump back to here for a minute. This idea that um, when I looked at the topics for um, the module, we looked at quite a lot di of different types of um, topics for the module. And all the time it's this idea of um, homogeneity and whiteness in higher education. I was very aware of that. And one of the purposes of the module was helping to deconstruct and reconstruct the meaning of racism for students so um, they could share and discuss their own experiences. And um, as part of this, um, we looked at topics to do with, um, we, we included 12 topics and of those topics we looked at um, what is racism? Um, how does racism come about? Um, have you experienced racism? So the first week was just talking generally, um, sharing experiences, sharing our understandings, sharing our knowledge of what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable, sharing our um, biases um, and students were invited to do that either through Padlet. I set up a Padlet and it was all anonymized where they could um, put up their, um, their testimonies into Padlet. We also did um, whiteboard um, exercises where we created either in individual groups where we then put it onto the whiteboard as a large mind map. And the students were given um, different post-it notes, colour coded, and the post-it notes were colour coded by the students. And the colour coding would mean, um, so say for pink, would would be a red or very triggering. Green would be okay, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, yellow was one, um, maybe if we get time. So on the whiteboard, it was fascinating. The students were able to use um, the post-it notes and able to navigate their way around the um, mind map that they had created in small groups, but then as a whole group. And then, then that was then um, supported with the Padler 
which was um, further supported by the open debates and discussions that we had in class. And um, there were some students who um, didn't talk um, for first couple of weeks, and then eventually they would say that um, they didn't feel comfortable talking in class. They didn't want to um, talk about this idea of um, identity. Um, they didn't want to talk about um, or share their experiences at that time um, because of what had, they had experienced themselves. Um, and I felt for well, the first two or three weeks, students were very comfortable in starting to open up, starting to um, share how they were feeling. Um, and what I liked about the idea was because these were level six students, I felt that they had a maturity about them and a um, an understanding for the module in terms of how far could we take the topic that we were debating that week. So sometimes I would leave it for students to be able to take the topic to a point of, um, you know, this idea of racism. I would talk to them about um, my father coming to this country. Um, he landed at Heathrow Airport with a pound and he managed to get to Leamington Spa with just that one pound. Um, I would talk to them about this experiences of um, my father, um, a qualified teacher, um, owned two companies in India, but he wanted to come to the United Kingdom for um, a better life for himself and for his children. And my father bought himself a brand new powder blue Mercedes. And um, I remember him telling me that when he got to the border between India and Pakistan, he couldn't pass through. And, these, and that was 1967. And he had to give up his Mercedes um, in order to get passage through to Pakistan and then eventually coming into England. And he landed at um, Heathrow Airport. And my father at the time was um, 26, 27. And when he came to this country, he was a qualified teacher, but he couldn't get a job. And um, so in the end, he joined the British Army and he loved being with the British Army. And um, my mum soon came over with my oldest brother and sister. And then my mum couldn't speak English at the time. And it, it was the these lived experiences that I would share with my students. When we talked about the impact of um, racism, when we talked about what does it mean to a person to be on the receiving end, what does it mean from a person, i.e. in terms of the perpetrator who has committed the racial um, incident, what does it mean for them? And it was fascinating how eventually students would start to open up and talk about their experiences or experiences that they had witnessed or stories that they had heard from friends. Um, but there was also this fear of they wouldn't report it because they didn't want to get involved. Um, I had one student in the classroom who, from a student's perspective, and this is also important looking at it from a student's perspective to another student, how one of my students who was black, how she would share her stories of um, this idea of how she had experienced racism within the university. Obviously, these were third year students. And, um, you know, this idea of she's born in this country and, um, you know, that the idea of, you know, racial slurs and um, and I would in the classroom listen to and watch my students and um, I could see the impact that it was starting to have, positive impact that it was starting to have on my white students because 
they were first of all and it says it in the feedback being taught by a lecturer of color i was able to share with them this idea of what it was like to walk in my footsteps and looking through my eyes of having experienced racism and these are some of the testimonies that came back from some of my students. Um, forgive me for reading them off, but I just wanted to be able to explain some of them. We would not have received this invaluable education or compassion and empathy without you sharing your journey as a person of colour in higher education. Students came back and said that um, in order to understand, in order, in order to share, to have this empathy, this compassion, um, this um, view, this understanding of what it's like to experience racism, you can read about it, you can watch it, you can talk about it to somebody else, but to be taught in a way where you have the raw experience, testimonies from the practitioners, the other academics that came in on the module to teach and deliver lectures. But because I, I was very open as an academic about my experiences of racism, there was there was some times when um, I remember in one lesson just sitting down and crying and the students, some of them just started crying with me in a in a in a positive way because they could understand and um, share my lived experience of um, what it was like to be in the actual moment itself. Um, there's this, ex this idea of, um, I, I did not know what it must have been like for you when somebody comes up to you and strokes your skin to feel your colour. I've had that in the past. You know, at the end of today, you know, I'm Nikki Wood. I'm, I'm not anybody different. And um, I've had somebody come up to me and stroke my skin. <laughs> um, um, then students also saying, I don't know what it was like for you and your family, I never knew it would be like that, or it was like that. Of course they're not going to know like that, and of course they're not going to know, unless it is, it's shared, it is shown. Um, a couple of students came back and said they questioned themselves in society, and I found that quite interesting, because what was it about society that they were questioning? And when we explored that further, that came back to their understanding of who they are, what they are, of their um, their morals, their principles of, um, was it something that they believed or was it something that they were taught or brought up to believe? Had they not looked into their understanding further? Had they not um, explored their, um, their understanding of what racism was. And this is why this reconstruction and deconstructing of um, the decolonization of racism into higher education was so important. Um, I love this one testimony where a student came back and said, thank you for sharing the real you. And I think as an academic, when I'm talking about race and equality and inclusivity and to do with crime in particular, I think for this topic to have made a difference to for it to have an impact and a meaning and to um, challenge the students not only themselves but the topics that we talked about I had to be me and I was fully aware of um, going into teaching this module of what it was that I wanted to share about me what practical um, um, activities I wanted to put in place so I, my um, seminars were very, very practical and in um, and interactive in helping the students to bring the theory and um, the testimonies together. Um, one student, well, a few students said, "Gosh, it's it's still really like that." Um, I loved your module. I feel more education and passionate about racism. Um, each week I would put up this trigger warning, content warning, and we would discuss this idea of, um, you know, what does it mean to be racialized? What does it mean, um, you know, from different perspectives? Um, 
students talking to each other. Um, I found some students who was disgusting, and I don't think I would have known that unless it wasn't for your discussions in the safe environment. Um, and again, it's having that experience and having boundaries put in place where students were talking to each other, where students did feel comfortable asking each other questions um, about uh, racism, about this idea of what does it mean to be called names, you know, like Paki and Wog, what does it mean to be called, um, you know, go back to your own country, what does it mean to be stroked? Um, my husband is white, I remember I attended a conference and they said to me, oh, you know, how will you bring up your child? And, um, you know, for me, it was like, well, I'm going to bring him or her up with love. Um, so I found that, you know, and there's all these little stories that I would share with my um, students, this idea of growing up in a very strict family, but being brought up as a Christian as well. Um, thanks to <laughs> lovely um, Aunt Sue Harris. Um, but it's I think as academics, sharing um, these stories with our students uh, and through this module and um, sharing this journey with my students taught me a lot as well as seeing those students. This was the first year I ran this module um, for my students and um, I wanted it to bring it back to this idea of um, you know, what is acceptable knowledge? What is official knowledge? And one student said to me, well, how long is a piece of string? Um, so this acceptable knowledge for this module, 2223, provided acceptance for the students because I think it made a difference for my module because the students had the opportunity of having a voice what they wanted to see in the module. So I made it very relevant for them. I made it more tangible. Um, and then the evaluations, which was evaluated at weeks five, weeks eight, and at the end of the module, um, I'm using that to help redesign the module for this forthcoming September. And then hopefully any feedback from this talk as well um, to be able to scaffold the students' learning and my own learning and as a result, last week I attended um, a ceremony and I was nominated as a finalist for the Outstanding Lecturer Award for 2023. Um, and a lot of that I found out from the um, testimonies came from this module. And, um, and I'm hoping that I can maybe do the same again this year with this module but again, building upon this decolonizing of knowledge and what is acceptable in 2223's module may not be acceptable 23 and 24. And then this shift of what is acceptable knowledge and official knowledge, I feel, will change again when I come in to do the developing um, and updating for the module in 23, 24. So again, I will be asking my students to participate um, in the designing of the content of the module, just to, um, because obviously each student, each cohort is different. Um, but it's this idea of, I'm also um, asking um, this idea of, students who did give me the feedback, the evaluation in how I could use that going forward. And a lot of it came back from using um, external speakers as well. So which I will be developing more um, into my module. Um, but just wanted to finish on the last few minutes of um, adding that um, when I attended the boards last week, some of my students were there and sadly, no, I didn't win, but that's absolutely fine. What I have taken away from this and when I spoke to the students again last week at the ceremony about how they reinforced, how they um, loved learning in my module. And, um, and for me, it's great because the recognition of the work that I have 
done with my students when I designed the module before um, I put it all together and then during the module the semester of having this debate and having the idea of talking to my students and all the time through all the topics that we looked at is what looking at this idea of um, what is acceptable knowledge in um, racism what is it that um, you know we do feel and not feel comfortable with how can we expand our further understanding of it and I think that's where um, you know, we had challenges, but also, um, you know, it's provided the opportunity for, I'm hoping that it will provide you with the opportunity of um, taking some ideas away, but it's also provided the opportunity of developing the module um, further for this um, academic year in starting in September as well. So as a whole, I would say I have loved teaching this module. I have loved teaching my students. It's been an absolute pleasure teaching them. And for me, in my learning, seeing it from a predominantly um, um, cohort of white students, seeing it from their perspective and getting to find out and learn about racism in a, in a, in a different level from through their eyes as well. So, um, and I'm hoping that um, I can share that further um, in um, another module that I'm helping with another colleague. So thank you for listening and I hope you've enjoyed my talk. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic talk. I know that I have a few questions and I've, I've got a few, um, few comments as well. Um, what I'm going to do is just jump into the settings and make sure that everyone is able to both switch on their microphone and switch on their camera if you wish to, you don't have to. Um, again, I'll just remind everyone that this session is being recorded, so just be conscious of that. Um, so does anyone have any any questions or any comments that they want to want to um, to ask Nikki? Feel free to pop them in the chat or throw your hand up, raise your hand, um, or um, or just go ahead and unmute yourself and, and throw those those comments out. We've got lots of thanks in coming through in the chat as well, Nikki. Just so oh, you're you know. all very yeah, no, you're all very welcome. Thank you for listening. Brilliant. We have um, Ahmed. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, hello, Nikki. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. My name's Mushra. It comes oh, up as sorry. Ahmed Lander. You as my son. No, I'm sorry. I can't change it. Um, <laughs> it trips me up every time. Sorry, <laughs> Mushra. Go, carry That's on. That's all right. No, thank you for your interesting presentation and I've kind of started doing that with my module as well mm -hmm. uh, engaging the students but um how do you and I guess I want to kind of get your perspective on this how do you if it's a predominantly white student group how do you decenter whiteness in the the process of your decolonizing the the module and episteme knowledge etc within that module of yours um i when i approached this and that's a really good question thank you so much um when i approached this and that was one of the concerns i had at the very beginning um because when i first set foot on campus Mishara, <laughs> the first thing that went through was wow this is white <laughs> um and um when I had the opportunity of writing the module and because of the content um, I thought right I need to sit down and talk to my third year students who chose my module about content what I was thinking of how I, sorry what I was thinking about in terms of um, topics how they um, received the topics, um, what was it that they would like to see in um, the module as part of uh, their learning. One of the questions I asked was what was missing in their learning? What was missing? What were the gaps in their knowledge? And um, a big thing that came back was this idea of um, multiculturalism, multi-ethnicity, understanding um, racism, from different perspectives in regarding different topics. And then, so they had some ownership over the module. They had some contributions towards the module. And I think it was through those discussions that I was able to break down 
some of um I don't know concerns I suppose or fears does that make sense um I just because you're using the decolonizing approach and the the kind of one of the tenets is that you start off with the very people that are harmed which is black indigenous minoritized peoples I, I was trying because it's because I, I I've got that challenge as well in my module as well it's like how because we are centering whiteness by the very fact that we're asking people who've been uh in in the realms of and and and, and grown up in, in the structure of whiteness to then tell us from there the, from that perspective about what they want to understand about yeah i, I find it like like it's a bit uh, it's contradictory there's a disconnect i i don't know it's un uneasy for me uh, and i have that unease in in the module i'm doing and i'm working with the students about that very honestly but yeah i don't know if that makes sense nikki just you know just a thought out there i'm going to be quiet now no, honestly, Michelle, honestly, please. I think that's where um, this idea of when you say disconnect, and I think that it's bringing the students with you. And this is why I didn't want to go in and teaching. I mean, racism is a very dry subject and um, you've got 12 weeks of teaching it. So I was already aware of that. But it was this idea for me was sharing um compassion sharing lived experiences so when you've got a cohort that's um hegemonic um and you're talking about decolonizing knowledge how are you going to bring that all together um you know how are you going to make sure that the cake rises <laughs> but so to do that i set about talking to my students um and i was very honest what i wanted to achieve through the learning outcomes through my um topics and i think that because there was inclusivity and there was ownership and there was a platform for the students to be able to express topics that they would like to see discussed in the module and then that opened up a discussion with the groups within smaller groups and then the larger group I think for me broke a lot of um awkwardness I think it provided a lot more congeniality between students in that they were coming together and being asked what is it that you would like to see in the module what is it that is important to you what is it that is important like like when i talk about acceptable knowledge acceptance 22 23 might be looking different for acceptance 23 24 because my cohort will be different so i went along with my students as well but all the time ensuring that i was adhering to my learning outcomes as well does that does that help you at all i guess i'm thinking whilst i'm hearing you that is it decolonizing or is it an anti-racist approach? But I will be talking about that in my presentation on the 31st. Just a little plug. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's taking. I think it's mind mapping, isn't it? Throwing it out there and this idea of decolonizing because you're doing it as you're going along. It's not something that we can just do at the, at the forefront, but I wanted to do that alongside with my students, I wanted them to have a say in because I needed to understand where they were coming from as well, which is not easy. Obviously, you can't do that in one meeting. Um, if it's OK, we can move on to another another question. There's a, there's some good questions that are coming through in the chat as well as. Um, uh, we've got one here that's that's saying just just wondering when you consulted with your students to co-produce the module, you said you got lots of ideas and experiences shared. This sounds like a uh, rich qualitative data. So she was just wondering, uh, or they were just wondering if you have any plans to publish this or um, to publish any data about this module overall, Nikki. 
Yes, I have. I do have. I'm um, I'm looking to I'm interested to get people's feedback today um, about um, the module. Um, I was interested in um, taking the testimonies and sharing those in a paper. I'm also presenting at a different conference. And again, I'm really fascinated to share my experiences and the creation of the module, but from a different perspective in terms of actually talking to the students themselves. Does that help at all? Does that does that make sense, Rach? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. Real. OK, good. Uh, uh, another question has come through, which kind of ties into this, to a, a thought of what question that I had. Um, so they say, thank you for sharing your identity, lived experience and knowledge. Um, I wonder whether you considered uh, means to avoid and protect yourself and others against the fetishizing of others pain when you when talking about your personal experience. Um, say that again, sorry, Rach, protecting. Uh, protect yourself and others against the fetishizing of others in inverted comments pain when talking about your personal experiences. Um, and I think so my 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 comment, which is sort of similar but adjacent, is is wondering if you found any any kind of resistance from from other academics when you're asking them to come in and speak um, around this kind of uh, this whole concept of it feels like society does tend to push the onus onto the other to talk about their own experiences of of pain. Imams actually who's asked the questions put their hand up, so feel free to unmute yourself and and clarify a little bit. Hi, thank you, Rachel. Can you hear me all right? I can, yeah. There, thank you. So, um, thank you, Nikki, once again. Um, so just to clarify my question, um, you know, like Bell Hooks and Sarah Ahmed often talk about, um, you know, when you go out and you speak to um, especially white people, whether it's students or, you know, um, senior management within spaces, um, that there, there tends to be um, fetishizing of, you know, when, you know, people of colour talk about their lived experiences of racism, you know, there's this whole, you know, getting pleasure out of seeing that sort of pain and, you know, the whole rehashing. So I was wondering, like, um, what, you know, did you um, consider and put in place any means for, like, protecting yourself and, like, maybe other suits of colour against that sort of fetishizing um, going on? Yes, absolutely. And like I said in my um, presentation, the safeguarding at all times, absolutely. So um, if um, I had three, uh, two police officers coming to talk, um, I had one um, ex-prison officer coming to talk, and obviously there was uh, somebody else, um, and then obviously I delivered the lectures and we did the seminars. So this idea of um, protecting ourselves from harm, um, when I approached um, practitioners or other academics to come and talk, um, I would inform them of um, the content, the topic that they were talking about. Um, obviously, I gave them the ownership of how they would, what content they wanted to include. Um, I was always there present during the lectures and the um, seminars I delivered by myself. And if there was any questions during the lectures, um, they were, um, I'd note those down or I'd ask students to tell me beforehand, are there any questions that you might have um, for the speaker? Um, if you could jot those down in an email to me beforehand, because then that would give the speaker time to have a think about um, an answer to reply back to the student. Um, in terms of, um, um, I had two black students, one Asian student in my class. Um, we have something called PATS, uh, personal academic tutors. And um, if there was um, any concerns, um, you know, I'd always make myself available after um, the lecture and then into the announcements on the module in Blackboard. I'd always say drop an email afterwards to students if there's anything you want to talk about, um, just check in with students as well. So this idea of, you know, pain, I think because it was talked about before we did any lectures or any talks and students were made aware of it, I think that helped to manage student expectations, but also reduce any idea of um, harm 
because um, students, I had, I have a very good relationship with my students and they were quite happily and open to come and see to speak to me beforehand. I'm not attending Nikki because of. So does that answer your question at all, Iman? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I've got we've got some a good chunk of questions coming through in the in the chat, and I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to ask <laughs> one of the questions from earlier on in the chat, and then we can go to um, uh, Peter. You've had your hand up. So the first question was from from Lucy. I'm curious to know how you set set up these spaces uh, um, and discussions for your students, and whether you use approaches related to either safe spaces or braver spaces or principled spaces. And and they're thinking of the work of Areo and Clemens and B A R C, in in particular when they're talking about that. Uh, no safe spaces. Um, it was safe spaces. So when I was talking to um, students um that was in a safe space um i would say to students where you're happy talking um and when we had a discussion it would either be in what we have our um in a cafe uh, at the university or there was a discussion at the student union um only small groups not large groups um so i would ask students you know as long as it was on campus um and it was obviously we were visible um, students would let me know if they were attending. Um, and also there was this idea of um, students would let me know how many they wanted in the group. Um, students would let me know. Um, you know, students had the choice of, you know, to making their own groups up. I didn't dictate who should come with which group. So that was decided by the students. So therefore, because they already had the little groups or friends already, they dictated who they would come with. So straight away, their um, comfort and their ease was already um, 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 considered beforehand. Brilliant. Uh, Peter, go ahead. Go ahead. You can ask your question. Hello. I think I've turned my camera on. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, it's not not really a question. Um, but it's just a, a comment on on how I used to do this sort of thing. I mean, we've got very similar background, but there are two significant differences. I think one is that I'm probably 25 years out of date because I'm so much older, um, but I'm also also a historian. So I'll just t tell you what three principles I used when teaching the history of crime in the 1990s. The three principles, because obviously this was before the terminology of decolonization was uh, was used or thought of. Um, but not not the principles, and and, and it was to raise what I called multi perspectivity through raising consciousness of the students uh, about the inequities of law, and not only of law and its practice. And uh, and even though the the um, examples are out of date, I think the principles hold. Uh, one is that um, I used a, a critique of the law itself, and I, I based that on what was uh, the work by Jason Ditton at the time, which was about controlology going beyond the new criminology, which was about looking at the ways in which law was created to control, in this case, certain minority groups. Um, but it not just the law itself, but also um, the ways in which uh, and obviously there are examples in history, such as the 1530 Egyptians Act, which was very, very targeted towards um, Roma, Roma uh, Gypsy uh, groups. But I'm I'm just thinking of the ways in which um, there were moral panics, you know, using social anthropology to look at the ways in which people and police interpreted the law um, in response to the way people felt uh, minorities and and others, whether it's to do with um, colour or ethnicity or even class, um, uh, were perceived in, in their actions. So uh, Stuart Hall's work on on policing the crisis, mugging, you know, the way in which the the, the controls of the law rather than criminology was was used to to actually target people or identify a group as being archetypal muggers. So I'm, I'm just, all I'm saying is there, there are interesting ways of skinning a cat, aren't there? Uh, but what I what I did, I suppose the bottom line is what I did was I prepped the students with this idea of taking a multi perspective approach to understanding uh, the law uh, in order to then engage in discussions with them about what they perceived 
the issues to be. And and and, and very similar to you, I, I also talked about where I came from. I was born in Hackney. Uh, my parents came from India, blah, 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 blah. So a lot, lot of similarities there uh, and, and about the Broadwater Farm riots and what. So I, I used the present as a hook to try and understand uh, the history of crime. So sorry, I wasn't really a question, but it was just saying that, you know, there, there are interesting principles that you might might want to think of developing um, to, to talk about ways forward. Um, hi, yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, because we looked at different topics within um, equality and identity, um, I would use the topics to set the hook for want of a better phrase. So we looked at um, policing and uh, racism. So I would look at the concept of policing so um, and talk about um, how racism impacts on uh, race, uh, on policing. You know, we're going from, um, um, oh gosh, McPherson's report and et cetera. So in all the topics that I ever talked about, so in any of, in the 12 weeks of teaching that I did, I would always start off with a topic to do with crime. Mm. And then I would then link that into e or equality identity and then link that to race. So maybe I didn't bring that uh, clear enough. And I was just going back to this idea of um, the work that I'm trying to do is not anti-racist. It's this idea of understanding what is racism, understanding mm. that how do we decolonize this information when we're looking at higher education. So I just wanted to make that really clear that my work isn't about this idea of um, just about being anti-racist and looking at um, looking at racism with white students. The students had said to me what topics that they would like to have included. Obviously, not all topics got put in, but um, where they felt strongly about particular topics. And one of those topics was to do with uh, police and racism. So I had a look at that topic of police and racism. So like you're saying, Peter, I always started off by looking at this idea of the topic in um, criminology. And then I would feed out of that into how racism impacted on the topic and then how that then related to equality and uh, equality and identity and then feed that into the um, practical examples that I did with my students. Mm. So no, um, I absolutely with you on that. And that's why I use the word multi-perspectivity rather than, you know, the, the idea of uh, anti-racism. Oh, absolutely. And I was just going back to Misharit's mm. points in the comments where she's put that my approach is anti-racism. She makes a good point, uh, but I do feel that, you know, one thing I want people to take away with this idea of I was aware of students' consciousness and of their, um, you know, managing their expectations as well. And I think this is why it was important of what is it in their conscience? What are they aware of? What they what are they not aware of? How do they want this explored? How would they, what platform would they like to see in terms of exploring this further? And then this is how students came together. And I think that when you look at this and you're looking at racism and you're looking at a cohort that's predominantly white, it's this idea of how can I get them to understand and share and, and um have this empathy in what I've got and then um, and mirror it to them, but through educational needs. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And, and I will apologise again for being a historian. But, you know, if I was looking at McPherson, I'd always go back to Broadwater Farm and earlier. But yeah, oh, yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go yeah, broad, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 1984, mm. etc. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll have a discussion. It's already going to bore everyone. Uh, we'll have a discussion now, uh, you know, another time, maybe. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you very much for your content. OK. Some really good discussions. Um, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to leave it there. Um, Nikki, there are a few uh, questions that we didn't manage to get to that are in the chat. So feel free if you can pop um, um, pop into the chat. And if you do get time to answer those questions, that would be ideal. Um, but just to say thank everyone for their contributions, especially Nikki, um, for the present absolutely fascinating presentation. Um, and um, for leading on such a really interesting conversation, really good dialogue that's that's kind of opened up um, with people that have attended and also in the chat. So uh, thank you everyone so much. Enjoy the rest of your day um, and enjoy the rest of the uh, decolonization series. Um, feel free to sign up to other ones that are upcoming as well. And we will send out the recording um, at a later date. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.